now my pleasure to welcome Kevin Greiner to the stage to tell us about our program and our keynote speaker today. Kevin? All right. Thanks, President John. Appreciate it. And um, it is uh, my distinct pleasure and honor today to introduce my friend Bill Rogers. Uh, the chairman and CEO of Truist Financial Corporation. So Truist is the sixth largest bank in the U.S. Uh, it's one of Atlanta's leading corporations, as I'm sure you guys know. And while their name may be relatively new, uh, its Atlanta legacy really goes back decades uh, by providing private capital and also community investment over many, many years. Truist and its predecessor companies have played a pivotal role in really making Atlanta uh, what it is today. Um, it's fitting, I think, that Bill is speaking to our Rotary Club because he really epitomizes the Rotary motto of service above self. Uh, he does this in the, way, in the way that he leads at his company, uh, with his clients, and uh, in the community as well. So Bill's one of the most genuine, uh, humble, and community-oriented leaders that I've had the pleasure of uh, ever meeting. Uh, he's someone I've certainly admired and uh, emulated in my career uh, at Gas South. And for me, Bill's superpower is really how he brings purpose, which you'll hear a lot about today, purpose and values into all he does and how Truist operates. Uh, Truist's purpose, uh, which is inspiring and building better lives and communities, is really reflected in how they show up uh, in the community and with their clients. And uh, purpose also shows up in their culture. And you see that uh, right from the beginning where everybody refers to each other at Truist as teammates, um, not as employees, not as colleagues, but teammates in close alignment with their core value of being one team. So Truist has certainly helped to fuel uh, my company's growth. It's a role that I know that many of the businesses and nonprofits represented in this room have also enjoyed from Truist over the years. But under Bill's leadership, Truist has been really so much more than just a capital provider uh, to us. Uh, they've served as an inspiration for defining our own purpose. Um, Truist inspired us to build financial literacy and wellness with our team members at Gas South. And they've inspired us to give back to our communities and we love to invest alongside them uh, whenever, we, whenever we can. And I also admire Bill as someone who leads his company and his teammates through change. Uh, just over the last 20 years, Bill's led his company through the Great Recession, a transformative merger in the middle of the COVID epidemic, and the regional banking crisis of 2023. And it's really no wonder that he is one of the most sought after and trusted experts for policymakers and regulators. So Bill's board service includes the Boys and Girls Club, uh, Operation Hope and Emory University. He and Ashley have a lovely and close-knit family, uh, many of whom I've had the pleasure of meeting over the years that we've known each other. And he is a uh, proud Tar Heel as well. So please join me in welcoming Bill Rogers to the stage along with Rotary member Katie Sayez, who is Georgia's region president. you he wrote a really nice introductory I, I, I don't message. think I could live up to the introduction this is, this is going to be a hard pull um, well I think it's I do think it's a reflection upon your leadership here in the community um, we uh, we spent a few minutes at our table this morning talking about company purpose and personal purpose so perhaps I shall challenge you with that question to start us off Bill so what is your company purpose yeah, I mean, those questions are questions we ask each other all the time. So our company purpose, as Kevin uh, accurately explained, is to inspire and build better lives and communities. Uh, and when we came uh, in developing our company purpose, the build better lives and communities came to us pretty quickly. We sort of said, that's what we do. That's the cornerstone of a financial institution. That's the bread and butter. That's the table stakes. Uh, and then one of our teammates just very you know, just with great wisdom said, what if we add inspire in front of it? What, what would that mean if we said inspire? 
Uh, and so that's the real motivation for us. When we're making a decision in our company, we talk about does it fit our purpose? Does it make sense? Is it consistent? But then we add that extra element, is it inspirational? What others follow? Uh, what others emulate? Uh, would it be seen as inspirational? So the inspire is an important part of the other, other purpose. And then we ask our teammates to, it's not mandatory, there's no requirement, there's no form to fill out, there's no regulatory uh, you know, line to put in there. Uh, we ask teammates to share their personal purpose uh, if, they, if they so desire. And what we find is when personal purpose intersects with company purpose, the real magic happens. So when someone comes to work and feels like what my personal purpose is, what my meaning is, what I'm trying to accomplish is consistent with the place that I work, there, that's when the discretionary effort, that's when it's no longer a job, that's when it uh, becomes more mission oriented. And uh, our, uh, my personal purpose, my wife and I have had this for a while, we, we make it sort of simple because I can't remember a lot of words in succession. So ours is to take care of our corner. Uh, and the concept of taking care of our corner is as simple as, was my corner better because I was there? You know, whatever my corner may be, early in my career, it might have been my division, it could have been a faith-based corner, or it could have been a community-based corner, and then as, you know, my uh, responsibilities have expanded, my corners expanded, so all my teammates are now part of my corner. So it's a much bigger responsibility, but it's the same concept is, was it better? And that's the test that we try to hold our, ourselves to. Uh, and I think they intersect perfectly. I think they come together perfectly. I think taking care of your corner and inspiring build better lives and communities is, is a perfect intersection. So for me, there's never confusion about the role that I play and the uh, alignment with our company's purpose and my purpose. And even though I'm being interviewed, I'm gonna put you on the spot. So <laughs> is this a fair thing to do? I don't know if this is a, ro our, is this a rotary violation or something well, of some type, I don't know. Our company's purpose is to inspire and build better lives and communities. <laughs> um, no, I mean, we do sit down as an organization, um, both individually and as a team, um, to reflect upon what we want our personal purpose to be. And it's a hard question to answer if you've not sat down and gone through that exercise before. And I struggled. I, my, I think we provide a workshop to help just narrow some thought and really help our teammates feel grounded and, and where they want their stated purpose to be. And I think my first iteration, Bill, was probably 14 sentences long. It felt hard to, to really crystallize why I feel the way I do about why I show up at work and, and how I show up at home. My purpose, like yours, is short and simple. It's to make a difference. And so if I'm at work and if I'm in a business meeting and if I'm there, I want to make sure that my presence makes a difference. And the words that I say and the questions that I ask and the decisions that I make um, in the community is how I represent Truist and am I making a difference on behalf of not just the community but the organizations and the people that I'm representing. And then at home, I mean, I have two teenage kids, and man, I want to make a difference with them. And I'm just grateful for any interaction that I get with them these days. So I feel like I'm making a difference in some small way. So for me, it's making a difference, sometimes in a big way, but oftentimes just in the smallest of ways and interactions with others, um, both professionally and personally. That's my, that's my well, purpose. I, I can tell from when I walked in here and visited with a lot of old friends, uh, you're making a difference. Thank so you. I can assure you about that, thank so you. thank you. Um, well, so John's done such a great job of, of laying out a theme that's threaded through our different speakers at Rotary this year. And when he extended the invitation to you to join, I felt, I felt very proud first on behalf mm -hmm. of, of our company. But I felt so um, grateful too because there is no better reflection, I think, of, of purposeful leadership than not just what you have done with our company, but how you have created that high level of expectation for all leaders who choose to work for this company around being um, purposeful in their leadership. So can you talk to us a little bit about the lessons that, that you have learned or that you try to teach around purposeful leadership? Well, it's not only purpose leadership, but I, I like the concept of service and growth. 
because they actually also should be linked. You know, so for us, we talk about purpose and performance. So sometimes we can sort of get caught up and well, it's, it's, it's purpose. Mm -hmm. But if we don't perform, you know, if we don't perform at our highest level, then we lose our right to, to, to uh, perpetuate our purpose. So I think they're linked. So I love the concept of service and growth, uh, you know, c coming together. Uh, and I think the, the difference from a leadership perspective is just to always talk about it. So, you know, we all learn things as leaders, right? You gotta repeat things over and over and over again. Uh, I, when I'm asked to speak about something, we, uh, every public comment we make, every public document we put out starts with purpose. We have our purpose, mission, and value slots. There are many cynical analysts out there that may not think that's a great idea. Uh, and they want to get to the numbers. They want to fill in their models. And they'll generally say, oh, well, Bill's got to go through the purpose stuff first before we get to what we want to hear. But the point is they acknowledge that we're going to go through the purpose stuff first. Uh, so I think the, the first thing in the, in the leadership is to put it first, is to go ahead and, and talk about it. And we try to be... Uh, consistent with what we do uh, from a from a from a public statement, uh, and then to try to make the connection. So, I think the 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 most important thing that that we do as leaders, I think the lessons that I've learned uh, were twofold. One is to bring clarity from complexity. Uh, our job's not to make it hard. Our job's to make it easy. Uh, I gave a talk once to a group of teammates and. I talked about the complicated offense, and I had all these charts and slides and things coming through, and I was, I mean, I thought, I was, just thought I did a great job. And uh, a teammate came up to me afterwards, I thought she was just gonna tell me I was awesome, and that was great, and she was inspired. And, uh, and she said, you know, if you think it's complicated, imagine what it felt like to me. I thought, wow, that was, thank you for that gift. I didn't realize what a great gift that was. And that's, I think, our job is to make it easy. So it's to bring clarity from complexity, and then it's to bring purpose to the work. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that we do most as leaders is try to make that connection for people and what they do. Every one of our 50,000 teammates is doing purposeful work. Sometimes the connection isn't as clear. It's very clear for you in terms of, what, in terms of your responsibility. But for our teammate in audit or for our teammate in the finance function is to also make it very clear that the work they do is purposeful and that it matters and it makes a difference. One of our uh, values uh, is happiness. I love working for a company that has happiness as a value. Uh, I mean, we just clearly state it. And happiness is not just smiling and you know positivity and, and, and all that. Uh, I've actually spent a lot of time studying the value of happiness when we put it in, went to some coursework, looked at the science, uh, and the highest correlation to happiness is doing purposeful work. So people who do purposeful work are the happiest, who they finish their day or their task or whatever they're involved in. If they thought they made a difference to make a difference to your connection, uh, then that's the correlation to happiness. So it's just always trying to always trying to draw it together, bring it back to that as I think the, the major lessons. Um, I remember last year I was on spring break and got a phone call about some crisis that was going on in a, in a regional bank out west. And it's times like that where when you can be grounded in purpose and happiness that even in some of the most tumultuous moments of your career, um, I think that it's a gift to have that. Could you give us an update? What's going on in banking these days, Bill? Maybe from a truest perspective and then what do you see from your lens looking out across both the regional and, and the larger banking market here in the United States? So uh, I was out in wine country that, Were same, you? <laughs> that same time. Um, maybe I drank more wine as a result of that, I'm not sure, but, but had to get back you know, quickly from, uh, from that. Uh, I'm going to talk about the health of the banking system, but somebody caught me I'm giving a hug to one of my fellow bankers over there, so they may have uh, <laughs> may either wonder why are, they, why are they hugging each other. Uh, you know, the, if we think about what happened in March, you know, we want to refer to it as a, as a banking crisis. Uh, but I think is what happened, and we sort of see this now, you know, fast forward, when 
you know, interest rates go up, so our cost of funding as an organization went up 500%. So just think about that, you know, your cost of funding goes up, goes up 500%. And I think what happens in those times is uh, poor business models and poor management teams get exposed when, when things change that quickly. And what happened in banking, because we're so correlated to, to the cost of funding, that's what happened first, so we led. You've seen that now, you know, over the last, you know, 12 months, you've seen other situations where companies that either had poor leadership or business models that were, didn't work, when they got under stress, they got exposed. And so we had, you know, organizations in our industry that were highly concentrated, highly concentrated, um, either on the, on the loan or the deposit side, and in some cases, both. Really, really high growth, really high growth in a really short period, period of time. And that got exposed when, when, when rates went up. And then unfortunately, then it sort of permeated across the system, and, and those were concerns about confidence, and our whole business is built on confidence at, at, at the end of the day. So the banking system's healthy. There's a lot of capital, there's a lot of liquidity in the banking system. You know, you've seen banks sort of, you know, come through this, um, and uh, I, think, I think you should have a lot of confidence in our system uh, from a capitalization standpoint, a liquidity standpoint. Uh, your deposits are safe. Uh, so, uh, uh, but, but what happened early is things got exposed, and we're seeing that in, in other industries today. And now what you see surviving are really strong companies with great diverse business models, diverse in every way you describe it, uh, and strong, uh, you know, leadership from boards and uh, and management. Um, I think it was last week, maybe the week before, you published an article on LinkedIn that talked about our partnership with the Braves. Yeah. When do you first, if you go back to like the origination of that relationship, what year comes to mind to you? How how do you define when we first became a partner with the Braves, and then what does it look like today compared to then? Yeah, we, we'd always had a partnership with the Braves. We'd had a sponsorship mm -hmm. uh, partnership. But it really, it really changed sort of, uh, this was actually coming out of the financial crisis. So, you know, this was a tough time for, uh, you know, our, our industry and our, and our country. Uh, but we had an opportunity. Uh, I'll give Jenner Wood all the credit in the world. Jenner introduced me to, to, to Terry uh, McGurk and said, hey, the Braves are getting ready to do something. Uh, and we have an opportunity to be do something that's never been done. Uh, so just as a you know curiosity, if you if you ever are in jeopardy, you'll have this answer that uh, that happens. Uh, we're the only stadium that's ever been named before it was built, and the only stadium that's ever been uh, announced uh, with a with a name uh, with an with a name attached to it. And that was the spirit of the partnership: is let's do something very different. Let's put both our brands into this equation. So we're gonna do something different. We're not only gonna build a park, we're gonna build the battery, we're gonna build something, we're gonna build a winning team, we're gonna build a winning culture, we're gonna do all these things, but we're gonna do that together with our, with our brands. And that's been, the, that's been the partnership we've had all along. If you ask you know, Derek our purpose, he'll say inspire and build better lives and communities because those are the things that we do together. And we decided early on that we didn't want this to be a, a naming right is interesting. I think in fairness, it's a, it's a vanity play. Uh, and, uh, but a naming right that, that goes into a different level in terms of partnership is what we wanted to create. We wanted uh, everyone in the industry to come and say, this is different, this is unique. I had a chance this weekend to meet uh, actually two different organizations in professional sports that had come specifically to tour the battery and, and wanted to talk specifically about our unique partnership and how did that get created. You know, we're, uh, uh, you know, every time, uh, every time a home run is hit, uh, Katie has to spend $755. That's true. <laughs> so we have a Homers for Hank uh, sponsorship. Uh, I think we've hit 800 home I runs or I was something. Ask you if you knew I, last I, I think, year. I think it's well. Last year was 300. 300, some. 300 and four, yeah. right? Something about. So you know, as uh, as you're pulling for the Braves to hit a home run, knowing you're also pulling for the community uh, in terms of what we do. So it's just it's just one example of sort of how do we bring all these uh, bring all these components together. We help sponsor. Uh, 
uh, two uh, fellowship um, opportunities uh, for uh, HBCU students to uh, do full year uh, partnerships with the Braves. So it's, it's creating those kind of opportunities together versus just the marketing side. We also do, uh, we also participate with the Braves Foundation and, and refurbish youth um, fields um, that are in need of investment. And one of my full circle moments, Bill, was when I was first in this role, one of my first ribbon cuttings was to um, um, announce the opening of Gresham Park, which is the park where Mike Harris played. And um, two Saturdays ago, my 12-year-old son played a tournament at that park, and he hit a home run on that field. I mean, that's just a full circle moment. Yeah. That's just so, that's so cool. And uh, the partnership continues to grow. Um, if, you, if you've been to a Braves game this season, who's been to a Braves game this season? Oh, we got to get you there. Um, you'll see a crane out in front of um, a home plate entrance. What's going on outside the park? Yeah, we are um, uh, building a uh, truest securities. So our commitment to... Uh, Atlanta, as part of this merger, was multifold. One is downtown. Huge commitment to downtown, really important to what we do. Katie uh, runs all that. That'll be critical to our future. But it was also that we would have our capital markets business be headquartered in Atlanta. That was a critical part of our merger, a critical part of our commitment. So uh, Truist Securities is going to be headquartered at the Battery, uh, which is... Uh, an incredible facility. Our uh, trading floor goes over a parking lot, uh, which is a, a, a feat on its own, uh, but also looks into the ballpark. Uh, so uh, we think it'll be a great place to recruit really super talent uh, to come and want to be part of not only coming to our company, but also being a great facility and a great location with, with a really cool you know, tie-in to, uh, to all of it. Uh, and in typical winning Braves fashion, you know, on time, under budget, you know, in terms That's of right. delivery, which, is, which doesn't happen much in this business. Not quite by opening day next year, though. That's what I'm hearing. Like the June time frame is when. <laughs> no pressure, Bill. <clears throat> not, I'm not going to get caught in that from this podium, but yes, we'll be we'll be on time and under budget. Well, speaking of downtown Atlanta, we are really at um, a critical moment in yeah. the history of the city. We've announced the 2025 uh, National Championship College Football Playoffs. We have eight games from 2026 FIFA World Cup. Lot. A lot of organizations are choosing to invest their events here in the city. What, what ideas do you have for those of us, those leaders in the room around how do we stand behind the revitalization of a city like Atlanta? You know, it's, it's really interesting if you think about Atlanta has all the physical assets that every other city would want. We, we've already made the billions of dollars of investments in the physical assets, you know, so we've got, you know, the, the, the world-class Mercedes-Benz, we've got a great convention center, we have all the hotel rooms, we have the aquarium, we have the college world, you know, hall. We have all the stuff that anybody that wants. So we're, we're billions of dollars ahead of everybody else in terms of, uh, in terms of where we are. And I think the challenge will be, and this will be something for all of us to work on together, is how do we make that cohesive? You know, how do we bring all that together? How do we have uh, Atlanta be the, you know, the, li the live, work, and play concept that that's what everybody wants in a great city? You know, they want to have an inclusive environment. They want to have workforce livability. They want to have high-end livability. You want to have it all together. You want people who want to you know, live downtown, work downtown, and play downtown. Uh, and I think that's what great cities do. And I think we've got, you know, we're, I think you're right. We're right at a, you know, an important inflection point, but at an inflection point with, <clears throat> you know, incredible assets and incredible opportunity. Uh, and the other thing we need to do is get back to the work and the office. And so we got to work downtown uh, and be there. Uh, and we're, uh, we're, you know, committed to doing that. So we want to be, we want to be physically present. We want to have our location here and have teammates who come and be part of the vibrancy. Who want to, uh, you know, go out to a restaurant after after work and, um, you know, go to the sporting event or the concert after work and do that do that from their downtown location. So I'm I'm going to be an optimist because I think I think we need to be. But I'm an optimist because we have so many 
inherent advantages and assets. Um, we're going to open it up for questions, but I'm going to ask um, one final question before we get there. Um, all right, let's see. I have a lot of friends in the room, so can we like blow through the opening it up for questions? <laughs> I'm, I'm allowing time for people to get to the microphone. All right, um, so here's an interesting question. Um, what unique questions or processes do you run when you interview candidates? Yeah, that is an interesting one. The, I, I do ask uh, candidates about their personal purpose. I do forewarn them a little bit to say, hey, this, this isn't a test like, you know, but, but I do ask them about what, you know, what do they stand for, what's important to them, just to hear how they can articulate that. Uh, because what I want to find out with a candidate is, are they leaving somewhere or coming somewhere? Because we want to hire people who are coming somewhere. Uh, there are a lot of people who are leaving someplace else. Uh, and um, I always want to find somebody who's like wants to come. Like they, they feel like they can have a fantastic career. Uh, they feel like they can fulfill their personal purpose. They feel like they can bring their whole selves to work. They can make a difference. And what we talk about today is in the, you know, Kevin, thank you for the great legacy that we have as a company. Uh, but we're also a startup in many, many ways. So we also ask teammates, do you want to be part of something new? You want to be part of something great? You want to put your, you know, your thumbprint on, on something new? So we already have a question for you, Bill. And as we have Bill Hennigan ask that question, please note the leadership lesson on the slide, bring clarity from complexity and purpose to the work. And I think you've covered that quite well. So now we'll come in with the hard questions, Bill. It's not gonna be that hard. And I'm glad you're here. Thanks for being here. So uh, we talked a year and a half ago at the one year mark of the merger. And um, you had tremendous plans and tremendous ambitions and pulling cost structure out and changing the culture and moving the ball forward and, and merging operations. It sounds like you've done a tremendous job mm -hmm. on, the, on the cost structure. I mean, on the, uh, on the culture piece. But now, you know, like the famous philosopher Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. And so roll that tape forward 18 months and tell us with that wisdom and merger experience what you'd do different. Yeah, I mean, thanks, Bill. The, yep. I mean, one, I wouldn't have tried to do a merger during COVID. So, you know, that's maybe <laughs> if I've I been able to, to, to do that. And um, the complexity of that, so sort of not to be understated, I mean, we, you know, we, did, uh, we did a merger virtually. You know, that's sort of never been done. We'll be able to chronicle that somewhere in a book in, in, in history. Uh, it did take longer and was more expensive than we thought. So we sort of have to own that. We've owned that publicly. We've owned that with our, with our shareholders. Uh, I feel great about where we, where we sit right now, but that, that time frame was, was longer and it was more complex. This was the largest bank merger in the last 20 years. So a lot of things had changed. Uh, and I think our mindset going into it because of what we both had done is we both had acquired a lot of things. So we had an acquisition consolidation mindset versus a merger uh, equals mindset. Uh, and I think we probably needed to marry those a little bit better. Uh, as we sort of went all the way to the merger of equals, we probably could have done a little more acquisitions on the, on the edges, made, you know, go a little faster, make some decisions more quickly, uh, and, uh, and expedite those, knowing that the commitment long-term was, was to do that. On the, on the culture side, you know, we feel great. Uh, I, th I do think we've done the things that we needed to do. Uh, people make choices along that, along that journey, and those are, those are real, but we, we're clear about what the choices are and what we stand for and uh, the opportunities to, uh, to, 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 to work with our, with our company. But it would be more uh, faster acquisition mindset uh, versus 100% merger mindset. Thank you, okay. Bill, first of all, <clears throat> you did a great job answering some of the questions and some of the comments much better than last time. Let's give him a round of applause. As always, my friend RK, <laughs> exactly. Are you ready? I'm ready, I'm Thank buckled you. in. Thank you. My question to you is, 
after the merger, your headquarters moved to Charlotte. What kind of impact you have in this, on the business uh, functions in the state of Georgia? Yeah, but Georgia is still our largest uh, employment state by actually quite a multiple. Uh, as I mentioned before, our commitment was to uh, keep our securities business here. So we'll have a thousand people that will move into the securities business. Uh, and, and then across our state, we've got about 8,000 teammates that work for uh, work for Chewis in the state of Georgia. So Atlanta, Georgia will continue to be critical parts of, uh, of our employment base and uh, and part of our and part of our journey. And, and as I said, today is the largest largest part of our company. Thank you. Can I add a comment to that? Yeah, absolutely. Well? Um, so when we announced the merger, we, we made it a commitment to the city of Atlanta that over a three-year period, the first three years after this merger, that we would double our respective investments from the two prior organizations. We would double their combined investment over a three-year period. And we track it um, every month. We sit down and we track it. Um, I'm proud to say that after that three-year period, not only did we meet that goal, but we exceeded it. And in the last two years, we have doubled what we did in the first three years. So from a philanthropic and organizational impact in this community, we stand very committed. And it's so important to us that we measure not just the capital that we are extending within the community, but our philanthropic investments, the hours that our teammates spend in the community volunteering and serving on boards, and as part of our, um, as part of our uh, benefits package, we give them multiple days off throughout the year to, to give back to the community. So it's something that we take to heart and we stand behind. And I'm very proud of the way that we continue to show up for this state. And it's a great example of where the performance and the purpose come together. So the better we perform, the more opportunities we have to continue to invest. Uh, yeah, welcome. Thank you for Thanks. being here today. Um, real estate question. Yeah. Um, a good bit. Surprise. It, yeah, <laughs> surprise. Uh, a good bit has written about uh, regional banks being under stress, yeah. uh, not just because of the high cost, but uh, real estate lending and portfolio issues and that sort of thing. So question is, how concerned are you about the, the stress for regional banks? And then secondly, uh, what do you think it's going to take for um, this relative freeze, freezing in the debt markets to uh, kind of come back to normal or at least a new normal? Yeah, and the, obviously the questions are related, right? Yeah. You know, so in, term, in terms of the answer. So, you know, I do think you make, make a little bit of a distinguishment. Um, so for larger banks, uh, like a bank our size, uh, our office exposure is about 1.5% of our total loans. You know, a little over that. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty small exposure. Back to my earlier comments around diversification is just critical. So we, we constantly look at everything we're doing from a diversification standpoint. So we may choose to, you know, uh, be um, uh, uh, more aggressive or less aggressive in a different place, but it's related to the, the diversity of the whole business is to make sure that we continue to stay, stay diversified. So I think from a, from a large bank perspective, I do think there are going to be a lot more challenges. I think the office environment is going to continue to be really tough. I mean, there's been an existential change in, in you know, how office space is used. And uh, there's an oversupply that will take a long time to work itself through. So, I mean, I think that's just a you know, reality of, uh, of where we are. That being said, for larger banks, I don't see that being you know something that's going to you know dramatically impact our capital or results. We may have some bad quarters. We may you know you start started to see some banks release um, uh, you know their their results, but uh, I, don't, I don't think it's going to sort of be be the demise. On smaller banks, there's more exposure to real estate. You're right, so they have a higher percent exposure. But it's generally not in large office, so it's generally in sort of a regional, more um, you know, owner occupied, and 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 those type things. Uh, those that might be highly, highly concentrated to one or two of those things, I think, may be more problematic. But I don't see that as being an industry wide, uh, you know, phenomena. We saw, uh, you know, a New York Community Bank, uh, you know, sort of a follow on from an existing bank in the acquisition, but highly concentrated in you know the rent control market in New York. Uh, well, that has its implications, you know, of, of that. So, and and most don't have those kind of unique, unique, uh, unique attributes. Um, all that being said, I think the spigot's going to stay pretty tight for a while. Uh, so, I think 
Uh, we're all going to be continuing to want to stay diversified, continue to look at our portfolios, uh, making sure we understand things. There are parts of the markets that are, um, you know, very open. You know, we see things like data centers and industrial, things that are going around the ports, um, you know, affordable housing. So there are certain areas that are continue to be strong and, and, and uh, we continue to lend into. Uh, but I think office is going to be tight for a long time. Lee? First, I want to thank Truist for what they do for the community, for colleges, universities, and healthcare. At our table, we were talking about the fact that not only do you live leadership, you talk about leadership. You have a blog, you, um, as you mentioned, you, uh, you post on LinkedIn. What, how, why do you do that? And how would you encourage others, especially in these potentially controversial times? Thanks, Lee. And uh, we, we also said at our table that the hardest job today is a university president. So, <laughs> so you and I had perfect alignment around that. You know, the, one of the really incredible assets uh, from our merger is we have a leadership institute. You know, I think it's the irony that IBM, I think, today announced, you know, the final sale of, uh, of uh, you know, the, or GE of the, great, uh, of the great leadership institute. But we have a leadership institute. So the principles of teaching leadership are, are, are really critical. All of our teammates go through some you know, significant leadership training. Uh, we bring clients in for leadership training, so help, help guide them on their journey. Uh, and then we work with not-for-profits. So we've hosted uh, HBCU presidents in terms of leadership. We've hosted uh, uh, CDFI leaders in terms of, uh, in terms of that. We've, in uh, certain cities, uh, we help uh, educate principals in the public school system on leadership because they haven't had leadership training before. And, you know, our, our belief system is the principals are like the sergeants in the army. I mean, they're the ones who are getting it done and, uh, and they've never had leadership training. So our opportunities there. So I think, I think just leadership matters. And I think everything can be um, uh, influenced, impacted, uh, and, and, and positively uh, by really, really great leadership. And so, so we want to continue to teach those principles. So, Bill, we're going to go into lightning round. We can have time for okay, a few more great. questions. Okay, great. All right, go lightning round. These are going to be no brainers. So, Randall, got it. Okay, okay, this is. Uh, I'm a brand marketer, so I want to talk about your brand. Yep. Um, when you guys became Truist, there was a lot, a lot of fun blowback on the name. I think people who understand brands were like, just give it a second. You guys have done a phenomenal job building a brand around Truist. I will honestly say, I think it's a stronger brand than SunTrust was. That may be controversial, but. I mean, you've got your purple pocket square going today. Always be branding. Um, talk to us about how you got to care as sort of the emotional core, because I'm interested that it's not, it's adjacent, but not perfectly aligned to the purpose that you talk so much about. So tell us how you transition to care as the core of the, the consumer brand, and then how have you sort of perpetuated and invested in that idea externally? Give us Great. a couple of examples. I'll, I'll try to do it lightning round. So when I'm with a group of hundreds of teammates, I always ask how many of you love the name Truist when you first heard it, and no hands go up except the head of marketing. Uh, <laughs> and then I ask how many love the brand today, and every hand goes up because they built it. Yeah. It's their brand. Yeah. They own it. It wasn't somebody else's, so they all, they all got to build it, and that's the, that's, the, that's the history. Today, fifth most recognized unaided band, uh, uh, bank brand in the country out of, from nowhere. So name no one never heard of. So that's a testament to, to, our, to our teammates. Uh, the concept of care is one of our, uh, is one of our principles uh, and you'll, uh, one of our values. And you'll see this in our new advertising that we're putting the uh, purpose and performance. So we're adding the advice and care together now, which we think now starts to create the foundation. But care was a foundational element to now advice and care. Love it, thank you. Jeff, wrap us up. This will be quick. But I want to thank Katie. She does a lot um, here. She's often given interviews, and her team uh, reaches out to Georgia State, Agnes Scott, Emory, and many others as educators. But this question is globalization, deglobalization, globalization. For many years as a global business professor, I wished you would become more global with UPS here and Coca-Cola. Now the world is in deglobalization, so you did the right thing. Do you see True as being more global someday, five years, 10 years? These technology businesses like Prime Revenue that are here, they are very global. So where do you see us going five or 10 years? Yeah, I mean, clearly more global. We don't have physical locations, but that's not means we're not global. I mean, we follow our clients around the globe and make sure that we're supporting them in the ways that we need to support them. 
I was at something uh, this weekend and had a great discussion on, uh, on AI and the impact AI, AI might have to the concepts of offshoring versus onshoring. So I mean, AI, when we all think about the things that it could do to impact workforce and whatnot, it could actually bring more jobs onshore. So I mean, I think this concept of, uh, you know, is it global or is it de-global, it's the same thing with onshore and offshore, is a whole bunch of different ways to think about technology. But our, our company will become more global every day as our clients. We'll follow our clients across the, across the world. Bill, thank you, and Katie. I want to also have people here from Truist raise your hand, please. Let's, let, I'll tell you what, stand up, Truist folks. And Bill, some people might ask sometime. Some people may ask you sometime when you're in another city and say, what's the commitment of, Lan of Atlanta to Truist? And I, I think we can give you a round of applause now, maybe a, even a standing round of applause to commitment to you, Katie, and Truist is a very important player here in our business community. Thank you for what you've done in giving back. So let's give them all a hand, please.